Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar. I am, uh, I'll be your host for the evening, for the hour, Dr. Jed Appleruth. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm excited about this one. This is a, uh, a talk I like a lot, talking about a little bit of uh, the brain, how the brain works, neural connections, uh, how learning works, uh, getting some use out of my uh, 10 years in grad school is always helpful. It's always a pleasure. The um, Tonight, we'll have the structure where I'll go through my slides. You know what? Let me put on my, my glasses, if you don't mind. Uh, a little bit easier for me. Um, we're going to go through uh, the deck, and then we'll have an open Q&A time at the end. One thing I always do um, is whenever I give these talks, I tend to cover a lot of information, but I always make a point to share the slides, um, to share the deck afterwards. And we also uh, are happy to share a recording. So that's something that we always do. So if things are, you know, you want to review them or go over them again or, you know, peruse the slides, you will have that chance uh, within a couple of days. Um, all right. So before we begin, one thing I want to do, I, I see people are still entering the room. Uh, often it takes a few, more, a few minutes when everyone gets in. Um, we're going to throw up a quick poll just to get a sense of who is in the room, who's here today. Just um, if you're a parent, student, and educator, um, or if you are a parent, if you have a, uh, a child in, you know, one of these classes, and then just finish that, and that's it. The submit will take all of a, a minute, uh, and then we'll close that one and go on to the next slides. Okay, so uh, let us begin. Uh, in terms of learning and the science of learning and memory, all these good things. So one of the, the key foundational concepts when you begin to get into the brain and learning about learning, it's, it's this giant network. The brain is a big network of connections, axons and dendrites and potentials. And it's constantly moving, rewiring. It's this br brilliant, beautiful dance of chemical electrical signals going back and forth and things getting more and more wired together. And I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a very plastic organ. It's always shifting after someone has brain lesions or a stroke, things move around, they reallocate. And you know, the cortex, um, it's, you know, it's, it's incredibly malleable. Um, you know, part of the brain and things can, things can move constantly. If you have a stroke and then the visual cortex can co-opt part of the certain motor cortexes, things can definitely realign. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but it's learning is about connections and, and wires and so forth. Um, neurons, you've heard of neurons. Our brain is made of many, many of them. Um, billions of neurons and these beautiful, and they're always shifting in all their, their long spines, grabbing onto other neurons, make connections across the brain. Uh, and these clefts between them, the gaps between the neurons, that there's neurotransmitters, which lets them kind of move and reconnect with different parts. And they send neurotransmitters, you know, glutamates and serotonin and dopamine, all these things back and forth. Um, and they're the, the messengers. So the, you know, the thing fires and the fire that shoots electricity and then it sends particles across this little, you know, little cleft. And, uh, and these they have receptors on both sides. So it's pretty amazing. Um, but what, you know, what memory is, is when these neurons start to wire together, get more connected, uh, and these things get into a pattern of firing. Uh, and so it's all interesting, um, this dance, but if you keep reinforcing a connection, that ability to fire becomes more efficient, becomes faster, then things are, you know, oh yeah, of course I know this. Um, what, things you activate and, you know, all the time, um, like the name of the name of your dog or the name of, or things that your face in the mirror, things you see a lot, you say a lot, you instantly recognize them. Other things are you know, less connected, it might take a longer to, to pull it, or what was that thing I saw? It's not as, you know, as deeply wired. There aren't as many receptors you know, between those two neurons. They're not as efficient in terms of the, uh, the amount of neurotransmitter you know, between uh, the two. Uh, and also the amount of myelin, uh, which is like a fatty layer of insulation around the neurons to you know, make that thing um, fire quicker, more efficiently um, for, for one to use a lot. Um, and so it's interesting in terms of how the brain works. And you start off as a kid, my daughter, she's one and a half, and you have so many more neurons when you're young. It's just infinite potential. You have, you know, like uh, uh, orders of magnitude, but it's so many more neurons. And then there's a massive pruning that takes place later on, which is why often you can't remember a lot of your early memories, part of it. You forget a lot of things um, that don't carry forward because things that you're not using anymore, things that are no longer necessarily relevant and you have like big blank spots in your memory. Um, but if the brain is trying to become more efficient and things that are really important, they're gonna wire tighter, more myelin, but other neurons just get pruned and wiped out. 
So, but the, you know, the brain right now at one and a half, everything is open and potential. You can learn so much when you're young. Um, it changes some when you're older, but you can always still learn. So the sequence of the firing of neurons, that again is what creates memories. Um, they're gonna fire in a certain sequence and that becomes a memory. Uh, you activate them in a certain order and the, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And part of it, um, there's a heavy network idea that when you have this certain chain of, of neurons firing together, other uh, neurons you know, are, are, are being repressed and not firing to make this firing more quick, like this potential. If I think of you know, a concept it starts tickling other neurons that are connected, getting ready to fire. They're like, an, they're anticipating because they're part of this chain of memory and so forth. Um, the key things in the brain, um, when it comes to memory and learning, you have the prefrontal cortex. And the work I do with students, I was working with a kid earlier today, is on executive functioning. And that'll be a word I come back to later on in the talk, but that is the orchestration of all the different parts of, of the brain and the ability to organize, to plan, um, to structure, to recruit resources, um, you know, emotional regulation, cognitive flexibility. It's in this part of the brain that uh, comes online and really wires up uh, later. Um, it, it's fully invested, fully engaged, fully connected at, at 25 years old. So I'm working with kids from the ages of 12 uh, to 19. And part of it is telling their parents, as your kids get older, they're gonna get better at inhibiting distraction at organizing and focusing at prioritizing, managing resources, not forgetting things. That just develops um, with time. Like the brain is still wiring and getting you know, stronger, more wired with, with age. Um, then you have the cerebral cortex. The cortex is the, the, the top part, uh, the later part. And then the hippocampus, which is distinctively, you know, it's, it's very much involved with memory formation. And when you have damage to the hippocampus, it really uh, impairs and affects um, memory um, when you have lesions in the hippocampus. And there's also been research like cab drivers who were learning, you know, the maps of the streets of, of London back before there was GPS, they had these big, very comprehensive tests and they actually had a greater density in the hippocampus. It's kind of cool that they were actually changing the thickness and density of their brain and they're, you know, with practice and so forth. So again, it's, the brain is, is quite plastic. Um, but long-term memories, so the, the hippocampus is tied to the formation and we embed the memories in, these, uh, in, in the cortex, um, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. And learning, so it's developmental. Learning is, you know, throughout our lives, we're gonna be constantly learning and evolving and so forth. Uh, and information is, is always changing, how we're storing it, how we're accessing it. One of my favorite things is was, you know, realizing that the memories that we access the most are the ones we change the most. And the memories we go back to again, every, every single time you activate a memory, you actually change it, which is so crazy. Um, you think, you know, memories are durable and constant, but they're always evolving based on new information you're getting, which you overlay upon the past. It's, it's pretty wild. Um, but information, so things are coming in through our senses, through our optical nerve and through our ears and auditory cortex, things come in. Uh, we have the short-term memory. And then with, you know, review and reinforcement, things are gonna go into long-term memory. Otherwise it's just fleeting sensory input, which isn't really meaningful or relevant, certain sounds, certain sights, but it's the repetition of it. It's the focusing and it's, you know, trying to, it's telling the brain this matters um, and giving it signals that, hey, this is important. It's not some fleeting thing. I have to actually use this later on. And we'll talk about how to, how to do that, how to help the brain recognize, oh, this actually is important because some things you need to remember. And the brain was designed to forget a lot of stuff. Forgetting is a very natural, healthy process. And people who don't forget things, it doesn't work out so well for them. There's a lot of clutter in there. If you never forgot anything in terms of like what you had for breakfast 45 days ago, it just doesn't really matter. Um, there's so much that's irrelevant in life. You get so much information and things coming at us and you know messages coming at us, uh, through, uh, billboards and signs and the radio. Thank God we forget so much of it. Um, but, um, and if we didn't, people who remember everything and actually even like in terms of emotionally, it's not good. One of the best features of the brain is we look back with rosy colored glasses. It's very adaptive. Um, people who look back and remember everything in vivid detail, they're not so happy um, because the, the hurts and the slights and the harms of old and the childhood, if you just remember that so vividly, it's not great. It's nice to look back and think, you know, and we actually do change our memories to make them a little bit rosier. That's a healthy psychological feature of a, of a natural brain. Um, people who are dysthymic or unhappy or have other issues, 
remember all the bad quite vividly. So it's good to forget. Thank God we forget. It's part of it. Um, so most input that happens doesn't transfer. Most new memories are ephemeral. They're not, they're, they're very fragile. Without reinforcement, they fade away. Like they, you know, these, these neurons wire together for a second. They hold it for, then if you don't reinforce it, they, they go somewhere else to, to wire to. Um, the hippocampus is trying to figure out what's relevant, what's irrelevant. Um, and what are we going to consolidate into long-term memory networks? And what are we going to shift to the cortex for long-term storage? Um, so that's, you know, the, the brain of like the brain as computer metaphor is often a big one we use in terms of you have your, your work memory, like your RAM, then you have your long-term storage. That's a pretty helpful way of thinking about the brain, um, the inf informational processing, you know, model or metaphor. Um, and working memory, it's interesting to think about there are different parts of it, of the system of working memory. You have the central executive. Um, we think about the frontal cortex, which is telling you know what to activate, what's important, what's meaningful. We're able to hold certain acoustic information um, in sequence. If I ask you to you know, memorize a chain of numbers, most people um, can hold between five and nine, and the average is seven, which is you know in terms of I, if I ask you to remember eighteen numbers, we'll have a, most will have a real challenge. But seven things you can remember, and it's it's the idea of chunking, of chunking things down to smaller bits. The brain can hold seven things. Um, and, but if I can like link things into the groups of seven or, uh, you know, then I, there's a, I, can, I can hold more if I learn how to chunk and group things together. Um, we also have this, it's called a visual spatial sketchpad. We can hold certain images. I might show you an image for a second, close it, and you actually can hold it. What's amazing is how much better like monkeys are at this than we are. Uh, if you've seen some videos on YouTube, you, they, they, they put up like 15 numbers for a second, turn it on. And they have them assemble like an order, which ones are in order in sequence. Humans do very poorly, but chimpanzees do much better than we do. They have this a much better visual sketch pad, a working memory system. Um, humans aren't as strong here, but we can definitely hold things for a little bit in terms of trying to reinforce things. And what I often do is like, you know, when I park in a certain place, I try to like associate the, the car, what's it near, E7. I try to make a picture, I try to hold that. So I'll be able to hold that for later. Um, and then there's this part, which they call it the episodic buffer, which can hold the audio and visual information in this, you know, in this little loop. And that can go together into long-term memory to make a memory, you know, of a conversation or something you saw and so forth. So there's also, there's a thing of working memory span. And there's all this research. That's something that we actually measure when we do intelligence tests and so forth. How many things you can recall or um, digit span can you remember? Getting a sense of, of your working memory. Some people have a bigger one. Um, they, they store, there's some, some genetics, some other things involved. And what's interesting, part of the research I came across in, in grad school, people who have a, a more robust working memory and a longer memory span, they tend to use different kinds of encoding strategies. And encoding, again, is putting things into long-term memory. Um, and people who have shorter mem working memory spans tend to use more shallow um, forms of encoding. Often they'll, they'll repeat things a lot, the people with more, you know, like deeper working memory often they'll construct diagrams or images or more visual encoding. They don't just like repeat things a bunch of times. And honestly, people just saying it again and again is not a, a very smart way to learn things. It's not just, you know, repeating phonologically. That's not a very helpful strategy versus deeper encoding, making meaning, anchoring it, creating things, working with that information, trying to integrate it versus saying it again and again and again. Um, and so... Deeper encoding, it matters, or they'll, they'll tie it to other things, they'll make mnemonics and so forth. Um, and also um, we do have some information that people who learn music, there is a correlation between people who are learning, you know, the fingering and techniques and all like the sequence of notes that can actually expand working memory, also can inc increase IQ and math ability, um, the ability to remember more. And think it, it just makes sense. If you're learning a sequence of things, I think about when I did like you know, martial arts, I learned this, this kata, the sequence of moves, and, or if you're memorizing things for a play or for a debate, whenever you're learning a complex sequence of things, you actually can enhance and shift your memory. So there is some, you know, some evidence uh, to that effect. And music is great. Music is great for amazing th a thousand things, but it also makes you a little bit smarter, more mathy and a little better for long-term memory. Um, and so there are different memory systems. If some of you may know this, like semantic memory, the difference between, you know, this is a ball, this is a bottle, this is a cup. Um, the procedural is how to, how to ride a bike, um, things you put them in there and they're just, they're in there. You don't forget some of these things, how to brush your teeth. Then episodic is what happened to you in time. And when you have different brain challenges or traumas or lesions, 
these can affect different systems, but often someone you know, has a really robust procedural memory, they know how to do something, but they've forgotten a lot of their episodic memory. They've forgotten what happened to them five minutes ago. One of my family friends is going through a thing where her short-term memory is really, really challenged, but her semantic memory is really, really good, knowing what things are, how to use them. But if your memory of like what's happened recently is, is really not, not strong. But procedural, she can still do things that, you know, her, there's a muscle memory to learning and so forth. So there are different systems. Um, and again, I mentioned the idea that memory is reconstructive. Um, when I started grad school, I did have this false idea that memory was like a, like a videotape and you press play and then it plays the tape. Um, and it's like, no, 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 that isn't how memory works, works at all. Every time you, you know, activate a memory, you're creating this long chain of neurons that are gonna be firing. And every time you activate it, anything that you've learned that's new or even how you're feeling, like that starts to impact this memory chain. So if you learn something new about a person, like you actually can, you, you rewrite, you overwrite um, memories, uh, things from the past. So it's pretty crazy uh, how flexible memory is and how it changes into grades and shifts. And uh, the memories that are the most reliable are the ones that we've accessed the least, which is pretty neat. Um, like someone who's been in a coma for 20 years, they're gonna have better memories of certain things than someone who's thought about this thing 10 times in the past year. Like every time you bring it up, you change it. Um, the one counter to that is people who have experienced real trauma. They remember things very, very vividly. And often those memories like really don't change. Like the amygdala says, danger, threat, don't forget this. And people with PTSD, often they remember it very vividly and it's really not shifting. And that's pretty interesting. One of my colleagues, like, yeah, you know, she was there at the Kent State shootings, like the year, uh, and, um, and she remembered, went back there and she's like, yeah, I remember this. And it was a very, very clear memory from that really scary experience. Because whenever, whenever you're, you know, or you're threatened, your life's, you feel scary, things do often lock in in a very clear way. Um, and there's research from like people in Vietnam and World War II, uh, you know, how people who are healthier, their memories kind of shift and change and move. People who have real trauma, their memories just don't, aren't, aren't they're not shifting, they're not getting rosier. Um, so a little bit about memory. Um, and so schema theory um, is in terms of, you know, what, what we attend to, how we construct meaning, how we construct knowledge, and the schema we have in there of uh, previous information, other ideas really affect how we hear, how we see, how we listen. Uh, when you see something that, that's novel and there's no other thing to anchor it to or stick it to, it doesn't encode as well. Versus if you have other schema, other, you know, memory things that are in there, it helps you glob on to things you already know. So you have this neural chain, and oh, this can go there and fit here and fit here. So previous information you have in your brain really helps you integrate new information. So it's like the scaffold for what's new, what's coming. Um, and I mentioned that there are different kinds of processing, there are different kinds. Um, and when you're trying to learn something, um, the, the, the kind of review you do really matters. And I talk about it's way more important to do deeper processing for understanding and for deep integration versus doing a lot of very shallow, glossing over, saying it again, repeating it, um, versus really trying to integrate it and, and anchor it to other things and make sense of it and chew on it and write pros and cons. I was working with a student today. Again, he's, he's in this AP World History class and there's a lot of memorization and the teacher doesn't give partial credit. So this kid is, is grappling and we're trying to figure out a way to, to work with this teacher and how to, how to memorize, because you know he wants these things chained um, and so how do I, like, I told them never just read your notes. Don't just passively read things. That's not really learning and that's not helpful. I'd rather you not read your notes 10 times or read the book 10 times. I want you to stop and start chewing on it and working with it, integrating it, um, making lists, making pros and cons, uh, actually actively generating versus just passively reviewing. Um, if you aren't struggling with it, if you aren't generating, you're not really learning it. And you're not gonna be able to retrieve it or recall it as well when, when he gives you one of these quizzes. So I want deeper processing and I want struggle. I don't want shallow encoding. Um, and there are many factors, um, Van Gerven's cognitive load theory of what allows you to learn more. Um, as you get older, you can often hold more. The seven-year-old can't hold as much as a 15-year-old, but you know, we have more context, more structure, more schema, uh, how, how hard the task is. The environment also matters a lot. I'm writing an article now on sensory overload and sensory input. And certain students in one environment, they can hold a lot more and in different one they can't. And we all have a, like a sensory cup for every one of the senses. And for some, someone, if they're in a room with a bad smell, that's gonna take up a lot of their, their cognitive attention and they, they can't focus on what's happening. Some people, there's too much noise happening. They can't focus. I'm, I'm kind of like that. 
Um, when I'm in a loud space, I can't hear as well. I can't integrate information as well when I'm in a louder space. Other folks, no problem at all. Also, visually, you put me in a room with a bunch of screens, and you put me in a sports bar, I, my IQ drops like 30 points. And it's just like, I'm so overstimulated. And I, I've, I have to work hard to inhibit the visual stimuli and the auditory stimuli. So for me, I have a maybe a smaller cup, you know, visually and, uh, you know, and sonically, acoustically, auditorily. So when there's more coming at me, it just fills up quickly. And so I, you know, I, I like quieter rooms, I like more intimate parties versus tons of noise and information. It's like, wow, I have to work really hard to listen to you. Um, and so everyone's different and there's no right or wrong. It's just knowing how your brain works, knowing what you need. The environment can affect learning dramatically. And often kids get accommodations for testing. They get a quiet room or they get, you know, certain things they can work with. Other factors that affect learning. Um, again, I mentioned working memory, the working memory span. Um, there are some differences just out of the gates, genetically and environmentally. Um, processing speed, how quickly. There are absolutely certain students have an advantage. And that's part of an IQ test. If you do the WISC or the WAIS, they're going to you know, see how fast you answer questions and read things. And that's part of learning. Um, and then you know, the ability, it's kind of tied to the environment, to inhibit and ignore things that are irrelevant. Um, information, irrelevant sounds, irrelevant content. And that's we have kids who go to a testing scenario, and there's someone crumpling paper behind them. And that takes away the, their focus from this other task at hand. So it's learning how to how to practice, and, and you can you can work on these skills actually. The ability to inhibit distractions is an executive um, function, and you can work on that and practice and build the muscle to help you become better at inhibiting things. Um, and so it's not just destiny, but you, you can change your brain. We know that um, there's a giant in the world of of memory. If you ever look up any with memory, you're going to find this guy pretty quickly, this German fella, Erman Ebbinghaus from the Austrian. And he was fascinated by his own brain. He's like, how does memory work and decay and stay? And he gave us the, the, the forgetting curve. He's a really important figure. Um, and what, what Carl said is, what, and he was using nonsense syllables. They sequenced this little like three-letter talk, talk, you know, like um, Ling. And he would try to remember chains of them and how much can I remember? And, and then for how long? If I see these, October 1st, how much of these, well, I learned 30 you know, of these nonsense syllables. What will I recall in three days, in five days, in, ten, in a month, in a year? And he would test himself with different sets he would have around the house. And in his own personal lab, he was you know, a self-experimenter back before there were PhDs in schools and he was a man with these cards. Um, and he found that every sequential level, every subsequent round of reinforcement you make the memory more and more durable and it lasts longer and longer. And this makes sense. And I tell students this all the time, like this is something I teach my kids, the, the Herman Ebbinghaus curve. Um, because again, you have so much nonsense coming at you and most of the things your brain just says, not important, let me forget about it. But every time you activate that neural pathway of firing, it tells the brain, this might be important. Um, if you hit that one time, it says, ah, I might, maybe not important if I review it, I retrieve that chain of events three or four times, they're like, oh, whoa, this must be important. If I do it 10 times over time, and also time matters. So this is, it's not, if I see something, I learn a new concept in physics or bio or chem or whatever it is, and the tomorrow I review it for an hour. That is not as good the way the brain works as let me do it 10 minutes tomorrow, 10 the next day, 10 the next day, 10 the next day. So if I distribute the amount of review and learning over more like the same amount of time that I break it up, I get a much, much bigger bang for the buck in terms of long-term encoding and retrieval if I spread it out. And there's a world of research on the, the value of distributed study versus massed. And we know that you can only handle so much in massed. The brain likes beginnings and ends. It pays more attention to beginnings and ends. And the brain likes more rounds of reinforcement. Just a long, long, so if someone's spending two hours prepping, I'm like, stop do an hour, come back to it later. Even if you delay an hour or two and have some interference between it, it's better for long-term memory than just keep hitting the same thing for three hours. That isn't how the brain works. There's also research um, in terms of doing it in different contexts that you start getting these contextual environmental clues. So if I review it, and most people don't do this. I mean, when I was in, in school or grad school, I would study in the same place forever and ever. But there's research that if I'm learning this material in this room with my gray background, which is my screen, then I go upstairs and do it in my bedroom, then I go and do it outside in the lawn. Every time I'm learning the same material in a different place, um, I'm, again, I'm giving my brain more of these visual clues and saying this really matters 
you know, and it actually may affect how I encode it. Like here with a tree there, with this light here, different environments help it encode deeper and more durably. So pretty cool stuff, but this really does inform how you should study. Uh, and most kids don't do it like this. Most kids aren't doing multiple rounds and they're, they're, they mass for distributing, but smart kids are better at this. And there's a whole thing of if you want to remember something, even doing one round of reinforcement 24 hours later makes a big difference versus none. You can see that here. If I learned something in class on a Monday, by three days out, my retention has dropped, um, you know, versus I do a little bit of reinforcement the next day, and then I really extend that curve of retention and I delay forgetting. So even a little bit of review the next day, and then if I do it again, a, a second round, wow, you are flattening it out. So you're gonna have, a, this is, the, the memory becomes much more durable. And whatever. So again, his stuff, you, you lose half of what you learned, again, um, within an hour, two thirds after a day, three, four hours, six day. That was, is, there's random syllables. But then when you study it, um, he remember them for much, much longer. So he was just showing us of the value of distributing. And then as the, interval of study increased. So I study it at three days and then at seven days, and then at 15 days, it just keeps getting stronger and stronger until this may become a memory for like six months um, as I increase the interval versus doing it every day, spacing it kind of getting longer. It's pretty cool. Um, and so Spitzer um, took this again, another um, took Ebbinghaus's ideas, like, let's see how much is recalled. And after, uh, so he had kids learn a textbook after one day, but half goes away, half sticks. After seven days, you've kept about a third after 14 days. But then, you know, it starts to, there is a, a part you keep over a long haul, but, you know, it's, you've lost 80% by, by week two, which isn't great if you're going to be taking an AP class or something where you have to remember it for a long time. Like we, without reinforcement, you lose a lot. Um, and so it's simply, you have to reinforce things if you want to keep them longer. Um, learning, one thing that's interesting with the brain has to do with narrative structures and for tens of thousands of years, we've had language for a long time. We passed, we, you know, we didn't have written language until, you know, 7,000 years ago with like cuneiform and other things. And it started to, you know, be a measure for accounting and then eventually to abstract ideas, but we pass things on through stories. And stories, we seem to be better. The brain seems to be better when there's a structure. And we actually are really, we, we love stories so much. We, we impose stories on everything. It's like we have a big part of our brain, um, the fusiform gyrus, um, the, uh, this gyre, which sees faces. So we see faces everywhere. We see them in grilled cheese sandwiches. We see them on wood grain. We see them, you know, uh, whatever. There's a brain looking for a face. That's part of our part of our brain. So the same thing. We're looking for a story, and I can give you random information, and you're gonna, you know, a series of things. You're gonna impose a story upon it. It's just part of our, part of our brain. Um, and so if you could put information into a story, um, and then you know, it actually helps you retrieve it better, creating some kind of a sequence of things as a structure versus just random bits. We, when we tie it together, it kind of chains it and chunks it, and the brain is better. I think about the Aborigines when they were like sing the song of a place, and they were like, you know, the, the water into this tree, into the dead. Like they actually remember visually through this, this connective thing. Pretty cool. Um, and so stories are, are good. Um, a few quick pieces that if you want to remember things, your sleep really matters. Um, the people who have the worst memories are those on like shift workers doing really erratic sleep schedules because your encoding happens at night when you're sleeping. Uh, the hippocampus fires rapidly again and again and again to reinforce these, these chains of neurons and that encodes it into long-term memory into the cortex. When you disrupt sleep, you are by definition disrupting long-term memory transfer and potentiation. So that's part of it. So it's, it's called sleep-dependent consolidation. The hippocampus, it's really cool. Like they'll watch a sequence um, like they'll, they, with rats, it's easy to watch them and they, with optogenetics and things, but they'll, they'll give a rats a pattern and that pattern will play out uh, during, in a certain maze and at night, it plays out again and again and again and again and again as you're anchoring it in that long-term memory. Um, and so it really, so at night you're actually learning. Um, sleeping is part of learning. Um, and, and so also at night, that's when you're doing a lot of pruning um, you weaken certain synapses, um, it helps clean away things to have a fresh light the next day, and you figure out what's irrelevant. So forgetting is really important as part of how the brain functions. Um, and napping, uh, I'm a big fan of napping. And when I was in high school, I would come home from my sports or activities, and I would do a quick one. I close my eyes, you know, you put, you know, and then I would come back and start my, my cognitive work. So I'd finish up school, then do wrestling, and then come back, and I rest 
and then I would focus. And it actually helped me really reset my brain, um, better attention. So little breaks are, are helpful, they're important. Uh, and I mentioned the idea that just doing a massive, like, let me learn physics for three hours. That's not great. That, that the brain can't handle it that well. Um, and we, you know, the more you're on the same topic, you start forgetting the other things you're learning, you start squeezing things out. Like if information competes with other information. You need breaks, you need time away from that topic to go back and relearn. Um, and so breaks are really helpful. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, the brain likes beginnings and ends the most. Um, that that's called, you know, recency um, and primacy. So the first thing you learned um, over the course of an hour, that globs on more easily. And the last thing you learned globs on more easily. We forget a lot of the middle. And I remember reading um, Daniel Kahneman. He's a very important thinker, philosopher, researcher, won the Nobel Prize, um, Danny Kahneman, for his work with, uh, with, with Tversky. And they were looking at like the, the memory and people who were having surgeries and how like the, even if the, the whole surgery was, was really, really bad, if at the very end it eased up and got better, then your overall past memory, like if your pain scoring is much lower versus you had a pretty mild, easy thing. Then the very end, it got very tough. Your memory going is the whole thing was tougher. So it's like the end we remember very, very clearly in the beginning, kind of cool um, in terms of, you know, we tend to do this. So, but the idea here is that, you know, things that are taught in the, in, 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 let's say at the second period, third period, fourth period, you're going to forget them more than things, you know, the very, very end. So the very beginning, the first period and the last period, you recall better on average than the middle typically. And of course there are differences if you hate the teacher or you, you know, after lunch you fall asleep. But in terms of on average, um, you know, most students are gonna have a higher recall for what they get first thing in the morning um, when they're fresh, because often things in the middle can interfere and so forth. Um, and so interference, it builds throughout the day. Um, and that's why taking a break can help clear, you know, because the brain depletes its stores of glucose, we're, we're limited. And what's really interesting is all other research, um, these, uh, we make poor decisions later, like as we go through, and there's all this research, like complex decision-making, you know, as we go further and further into a session, it wanes. As the glucose in our brain is depleted and our synapses get tired of firing, we start, in, you know, it's harder to inhibit impulses. We, it's harder to do heavy cognitive things, be flexible, be more nuanced in our thinking. And there's research that closer to lunch, these, uh, these, these judges who are handing down sentences, as it gets closer and closer to lunch, as they get hungrier and hungrier, um, they're less likely to reverse a case later in the day. So where you are on the docket matters a lot. If they get you fresh at 8.30 in the morning, there's a much higher chance the judge will reverse a, a, a hard thing versus towards like 11.45, the odds are much, much lower. So we get tired, like we're not machines and our brains do need breaks. Um, and so interference builds up, they get tired, and so breaks are important, food's important. Um, and, but there's something, the similarity principle that's really important. If you change topics, you have le less interference. A brand new topic will not interfere as much as doing more of the same. So if I do chemistry for three hours, there's more and more interference building up versus I do chemistry for an hour, change over to French, um, and then, then go to bio, then back to chemistry, I'm gonna have much better recall than if I went just uh, this big, huge push of chemistry. And this, you know, so blocks, you know, it's so smaller intervals are actually better for learning. Uh, and mixing things up is, is, is superior, really interesting. So more beginnings and more endings is better for the brain. Um, other things I mentioned, you know, I, I would take a nap after I come back from school. Um, brain breaks are great. Taking a walk, using your body, uh, you know, looking out at a natural landscape is, is lovely. Um, and I was talking tonight to one of my students who about, about cell phone uses. All of my kids I'm working with, they're all grappling with their cell phones, as adults are, as all of us do, because these things are designed to recruit our attention and hijack it. These are smart developers, psychologists who are working with these things. But the whole thing is this, having good boundaries. And my student is very smart that he actually locks down some Snapchat, which is his primary cause of distraction. But after he finishes a subject, He'll let himself go in there, go through some of the snaps, review some things, or watch a video on YouTube, and then turn it off and go back. And I love that. I love having a discreet, I'm working, that I'm playing, then I'm back to working, that I'm playing. And so you're using self-reward, reinforcing, self-consequencing, um, versus my students who get in trouble are the ones who have this thing open while they're working. And every notification, every ping, every Instagram thing, every Snapchat thing, totally disrupts your processing, your deep work, your focusing, 
and it changes your encoding. It makes it much more shallow. And so it takes much longer and everything you're doing, you aren't learning as well. So learning how to have discrete breaks, um, which are lovely versus having being pinged while you're working, which is really, really tough on memory and learning. Um, and that's something I really work with my kids on. Uh, I talked about, you know, the, the mental, like the sensory cup and how much stimulation too much. It's not great. Um, and there are people, you know, who thrive in chaos, um, but a lot of folks don't. And if things are too disordered, and noisy, they have to actively inhibit all the visual signals coming at them. And that takes away cognitive resources for other task appropriate kind of things. So trying to tune out noises. And for me, when I have a clock that's ticking, I'm probably giving a fourth of my mental energy trying to not hear the clock. And so like when I, you know, bought my office at work, I replaced every ticking clock with silent clocks and it's helped, you know, for my own idiosyncrasies. That's how my brain works. I hear that ticking and it becomes like, you know, I, I focus on it. So interference, be mindful of how much you need and don't need. Um, and what, and exercise, amazing, the best thing ever. So good for serotonin and dopamine, for calming down anxiety. Uh, and also for, you know, we know when there's cardiovascular activity, you actually have neurogenesis and, and synaptogenesis. You have new, new, new uh, synapses are forming when you're doing cardio activity. So it's great for learning and for clearing out all the junk. Um, I mentioned changing context, more, more cues for retrieval. Um, then we're gonna shift to um, techniques for learning. And, and the important is one of the big takeaways here, if you get, you know, hopefully you've gotten some other little, little nuggets during this, the course of tonight, um, but passive learning stinks. Passive review, just reading something listening to something, if you're not constructing, if you're not integrating, struggling, you're really not learning that well. And I know this, I know this when I do, when I read books and I just read them and put them away and I, I fold pages, I dog ear them, I highlight them. If I don't review my highlights or do something with them, I go back to it. My, my recall is so weak. And now I've, I, I've read hundreds of books as adults. We all have, I like, like, what was that book about? And I have a few things. I remember a few salient points. Most of it, I forget. And I, I play podcasts a lot. And my wife laughs because I, I play them at pretty fast speeds. Um, you know, I put 1.7 or 2, 2x. I just get bored if they're too slow. But then, so I, I can play more podcasts more quickly. But then when I stop, it's like, what, did it, what was the first pod? What was the, the third podcast? And it's like, huh. And it's like, I'm, I'm filling information. I'm, I'm hearing, but it's like, what am I actually retrieving versus if I go home and I explain it to my wife? And that's, you know, she'll complain that I, I teach too much. But to me, it's often, it's how I, how I learn. Like by teaching someone else something I've learned, it locks into my memory better. And there's all this data about like peer tutoring that the ones who are, are teaching, like the, the higher level peer are the ones who are learning the most. And they're crystallizing the things into, into the long-term memory. By teaching, you learn and you encode and you lock things in memory better. So teaching is great. Or if you're gonna write about it, but just if you just play, if you just play a podcast and then go on with your day, you know, most likely, unless you tell somebody about it, you're going to forget a lot of information later on. Um, so it's, it's constructing. And so by teaching, I'm having to choose things. I'm making choices of what I'm going to remember, what's important, what's salient for me. Um, I'm tying things together and making connections. Um, I'm drawing, like, so kids who are constructing. So my students, I'm like, you know, Mateo, don't just read the chapter for AP World. I want you to draw maps. I want you to like link this idea to that or make little arrows. This goes to this. Um, by the drawing, they're using their hands, other parts of the brain, the motor cortex. Some kids are more kinesthetic. They, they actually helps them moving. Um, you know. Um, also, I'm making choices. I'm starring. I'm prioritizing. I'm, I'm putting the asterisks. I'm saying this is important. I'm making a decision versus just reading information. I'm not making any choices. Um, there's a linking, choosing, working, constructing, building, a better way to learn. And then relating things to what you already know, tying it back, integrating things. Again, the, the brain works if there are previous memory stores, other things it can, it can, it can stick onto, it's a much better time than having it just be undifferentiated information. Once you link it to other ideas, it's much better to build this, this scaffold. Um, so you're organizing things, structuring things, looking for similarities um, and tying them to other things. The human brain loves metaphor. And essentially I've heard some people postulate all learning is making metaphors of how this is like this. And you know this thing you're learning, oh, it's like this other thing you already know or it's connected in some way. So we have like the idea is that our brains are just designed for metaphor as well. It's how we learn. Um, and so when you're trying to really learn something, you're, you're generating, you're constructing, you're struggling, you're generating, you're creating, um, and you're having to force yourself to, to learn things and recall things. And also to elaborate, 
um, tie, you know, tying things together into long-term memory uh, and so forth. Um, so I mentioned spaced retrieval. It's nicer, it's actually better to do one round of very deep processing and thinking and working and connecting of how this makes sense tied to this idea. Once you really get it versus just let me, let me repeat it uh, phonologically 10 times, which it's, it's, it's called shallow encoding, which we know is pretty much worthless. Um, and then in terms of other learning aspects, um, and I see there are some questions coming in. Keep coming, I'm gonna make time at the end. And I'm gonna probably skip some of my slides to make sure I have time for some Q and A. Because my decks are always too big and I'm not gonna make myself rush through it all. I, I'm, I'm always over ambitious. Um, but students who are self-regulated, they're monitoring themselves, they're learning, their own motivation levels. I was so proud of my student uh, today. He, he told me that you know he did really very, very well on this um, uh, English literature class. I'm like, well, how'd you do it? He brought, he brought his B to an A. And it's like, well, he had a quiz. What he was doing, he had, was reading this book that was pretty hard for him. He went um, on this audiobook thing and got a free download from, from Audible. And he played this free audiobook tied to his book, which helped him. And then in a class, he was having a pretty easy time in computer science. So he was going and he went on Quizlet. I, I love Quizlet because people have already like loaded up questions for you to test yourself on. I love self-testing. So he was sitting there doing some quizzing on himself during, in his class immediately prior to his, 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 his quiz. And so he did the audiobook thing, Quizlet, going over the character names from this book. He went in there and just killed this quiz. And I was back to an A. I'm like, good for you. And I asked him, like, you know, where'd you learn that? Other students or is that self-generated? But he's being creative and flexible and he's trying different things. And I love people who are being resourceful and looking at, you know, how do I get better? I, I'm not happy with my B or my C. And you start trying stuff. So flexibility, I love it. Versus just let me try the same thing and do more of the same thing. Try different things. It's called cognitive flexibility. It's really great. And this is part of self-regulation of your own learning. As you become a master of your own learning, when you begin to figure out what do you need, how does my brain work, um, you know, because everyone learns differently. Um, it's we have certain advantages, certain ways. Uh, you know, certain people have a, a thicker visual cortex, and they are able to you know hold images better than others. I'm a painter. I, I see more. I, I can sometimes it's very visible. I can see where on the page it was of certain things. Other folks, not at all. Other folks, they'll remember it very differently. So it's learning how you learn and then working with that. It's really important. And this is all, you know, these are all aspects of self-regulation of learning, of, of, of looking at your goals, calibrating how well do I know this? That's a really big thing of calibrating your comprehension. Do I understand this? Do I not know this? And knowing it's, it's called metacognition. Do I need help here? Is like, and there are times with metacognition where it's, it's a voice which tells you stop, you, hammer time, like you didn't learn this. Or I'll play, a, I'll play part of a podcast and kind of complicated. It's like, wait a minute. I'm not getting this. And that little voice, that's the metacognitive voice saying, you know, you're not learning. You're playing it. You're, 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 and many of us read before we go to bed. And it's that little voice which says, this last page you read, you didn't get any of it. Then it's like, all right, time to turn the light off. Or if I really, I, I go read it again. And that's important for kids to realize they, they're, they're not getting something. Um, and so the, these self-regulated learners, my, you know, they're, they're working, they're choosing, they're being reflective and thoughtful about things that are working for them and not working. And this is also tied to executive functioning, There's like learning what you need to learn better. This, you know, understanding what you know, what you don't know. And what's interesting in terms of estimation of comprehension and knowledge, many kids greatly overestimate how much they know. Um, and it's um, the poorest students think they know a lot more than they actually know. Um, but the best students, they, you know, they're gonna say, you know, I, I don't know enough and often you know, I thought it was kind of silly. Some people was like, I'm, I'm not ready for this. But actually, you know, they, uh, they, they may know the things very vividly they don't know, whereas a student who feels very confident doesn't really understand how much they don't know. And so testing is, is, is a single best way, testing yourself and saying, oh, I got 19 out of 20. I'm actually fairly, you know, my confidence is, is earned versus my confidence is false. And, and, and part of it is what evidence are you using for your confidence? What, what measures? And there's a whole thing about gender and boys they're using different mechanisms to determine their, their confidence levels than girls. And often boys, there's a problem of overconfidence um, globally, not individually, but looking at the, the whole cohorts. Um, so metacognition is a big idea, um, but knowing what you know, knowing what you need, knowing I need help, knowing I need a break, knowing you know I need something else. Uh, you make adjustments uh, that things aren't working, let me try this, or I'm bored, let me put this book down and come back to it later. That's a, that's a metacognitive shift. I need, I need a break right now. 
Let me call a friend. Let me ask, you know, Jennifer how she's doing this. Let me get, let me up resource or let me get a tutor or talk to the teacher. These are all, you know, important things. Like help seeking is something I, I teach my students also, how to become a better self-advocate when you, when things aren't working out versus just white knuckling it and buckling down, trying harder. It's like, no, no, get, get, get smart, learn, you know, try something different. Um, and then there are different ways of learning from a text, um, but you could skim it and take notes and annotate it, review it. Um, and kids who are using more strategies for how they read end up with higher GPAs. Kids who are summarizing, looking for ideas, um, looking up words they don't know versus kids who are just passively reading. So the more active, the more engaged, the more generative, the better, the better you are. Um, and uh, motivation, I promised a few hints about that. My favorite theory, I, I probably mentioned it in a thousand of my talks over the 20 years. Um, it's DC and Ryan, researchers at Rochester, Maryland. They, 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 you know, ultimately they were saying for motivation, three things that are essentially universal for humans. We have a innate need to be competent. And I see that with my little daughter at one and a half, and you see it with your kids who are 15 or 17 or, um, and that something has to happen to get frustrated for them, for them to say, I don't care, or I don't wanna, you know, they, there has to be some disappointments and frustration before they check out and say, I don't care about this topic. That we start off with, you know, there's an innate desire to want to learn and be competent about things. Um, autonomy is a big deal. And um, I told my student earlier, you know, if you could keep doing well and they ultimately, if, if our sessions aren't serving you anymore, you have all A's and a B, um, at some point, like we're good. And I want you to feel like you have agency and you're in control here. And if you don't need my, you know, my help, I, I'm, I'm great. And I'll tell the parents and everything else and, you know, versus feeling like th things are being put upon them and they don't have agency or choice or autonomy. And it's important, especially as, as students are individuating and, and trying to you know, become more independent, which is really important. And ultimately all parents, most of us, you know, without some strangeness, they want our kids to be independent and autonomous. Because I'm working with a high school sophomore, he'll be in college in a couple of years. You know, and, you know, he's, you know, three years, he's going to be on his own. So part of it, we want him to be able to be more independent. Um, and then finally, so competence, aut you know, more autonomy, more competence, and then related, because we also, learning is social. That was a piece from Vygotsky. Learning doesn't happen in a vacuum. Learning is tied to learning from another. Um, and then reinforcement, being observed, being seen sharing things, these are, so if I want someone to become, you know, more motivated, the idea is focusing on giving them experiences of competence, giving them a degree of autonomy and choice. And I, you know what, I, I was proud of myself today. I got a little pat in the back um, for myself. I, I did something different and um, I was learning. And because I learned that the parents actually called me with my student and said, the student is really frustrated and feels like the sessions aren't working or they're a waste. They also gave me, you know, some, context that this student has fired four other coaches and basketball coaches and music like ultimately the student has it resists somewhat being coached and so like they, they told me don't take it personally but it may be you have to approach it differently and so i actually stopped and i asked my student where i'm failing him and where i'm not doing well and what what am i doing that that's worthless for you and i asked him like you know for the last six weeks what's the most valuable thing that i've done to you uh i'm sorry done with you um, in terms of our, our, our sessions, and then what's the, the most and least valuable? And he said, every week we're reviewing what I have coming up in every single class. He's like, that's not as helpful to me in terms of my challenges per class. He's like, I, I kind of know how I'm doing, what's coming up. Um, so let's, as so I said, all right, I will stop doing that. And honestly, I saw a little bit of a, a change in his face when he realized I was listening to him. And I was, hey, what, what you want is important. And I, I'm a coach here, I'm not the superior. And ultimately, you know what you need. And you telling me this is not, not helpful, I'm going to respond to that. And so part, for me, it's putting my ego away and really listening and meeting my students where they are. And suddenly I'm getting some currency and some rapport by respecting my students' needs and, and his emotions and feelings. And I said, no, ultimately, I, you know, I'm, I'm in your corner here, but it's not about me. This is about you. And so I think asking him where I'm screwing up and what's, what's not helpful, um, I'm going to probably bring that to other sessions because I, I saw the change in him. It's like, huh, that could be useful in other, other domains as well. Um, Lev Vygotsky, powerhouse researcher, Russian fella, and talked about you wanna get involved only when students are on the cusp of failing or actually failing. If they're doing well, don't get in the way. Um, let them thrive, don't, because you can actually interfere. Um, don't impose if you know, you know, let them. So the scaffolding is you wanna put the lightest scaffold only if they need you when they need you. Otherwise, let them do their thing. Um, 
Uh, this isn't that important. It's the long and short of this one. Learning, I'm gonna, learning styles, the idea that I'm a visual learner or I'm auditory or I'm kinesthetic. And that's, it's, the truth is we're all visual learners. We're all auditory, we're all kinesthetic learners. Um, one of my colleagues in my doctoral program, Josh, did this research on this, that the idea of dual coding, that all humans do better when you interweave visual and auditory learning together. So it's not, I'm a visual learner, like every human is a visual learner. And, we, and a big part of our cortex is visual. And actually for most people, visual does trump, like about four tenths of our brain is, you know, the visual cortex is tied to image. Because for so many years, we didn't have language. We had, we, you know, spent millions of years looking at things. So our brains really see in images and pictures and they're very powerful. Um, but ultimately, um, in Cuevas, when you, you know, match someone with a more auditory style of instruction versus visual, no one does as well as when you link them. When you give someone visual information and auditory, you're, they're hearing it and they're seeing it, that links in better. And the, the theory is you have a verbal pathways in the brain and auditory, you have less interference when you're using both pathways. You're stimulating both these neural tracts and so retention is just better. And, but ultimately there is evidence that, you know, we are, um, we're, we're geared towards, towards vision. So 3% three, three of our brain is, is geared towards hearing in terms of the neurons allocated to that. And 30% plus of the cortex is, is tied to the vision. So, or, you know, in the back. So grand scheme of things, um, though, though, although I mentioned that this can all change because the cortex essentially is cortex. The idea that visual is different than auditory, it's all cortex and it can be repurposed and things can move around. It's just the cortex is the cortex. Um, but it seems there's a lot more tied to the optic nerve and how things are wired up our dendrites and so forth. Um, but when it comes to the brain and memory formation, whenever you can give someone a dual coding, whenever you give them something they can hear and see, it's always better than either one sense of the lens. That's just how humans are built. Um, so visual encoding trumps verbal encoding. So it's called bimodal processing. Um, simultaneously seeing and hearing is better. Um, I'm gonna get over this. Okay, so um, other things, there's research, um, Donlosky powerhouse in my, in my field, Things that are not that useful, and these are meta-analysis using looking at hundreds of studies. When you highlight, it's you're not really learning very much. I highlight because it's kind of fun; my hand can move. Um, if I'm going to go back, it's useful to see things. But just by highlighting, I haven't learned any more than by not highlighting. Um, imagining things, okay. Rereading is not that helpful, and that's something which is like really power because it's amazing. Most kids just read. You know, I'm going to read the chapter four times. I'm going to stop. Do not read it four times. Read it one time, then work with it, test yourself, query fine. Because if you aren't testing yourself, you aren't, you know, you're not linking things longer into long-term memory. Um, but things that are really helpful are practice testing, um, are spreading things out over time, and also interleaving practice. I do a little bit of bio, a little math, come back to the bio. That's effective. And so many students don't do this. Um, testing. All right, and, and this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here, and then I want some Q&A time because I'm, I always run over. It's kind of how I do it. But when you test, this is an important point before we move on, um, that every time I forcibly retrieve information from my long-term memory, I'm locking it deeper and deeper into long-term memory. So testing, like even like flashcards and Quizlet, other things, whenever you force yourself to recall things unaided, um, I'm unaided retrieval and recall, makes the neurons say, oh, this matters. Let's lock a little bit tighter. Let's, let's make the synapse a little bit stronger in terms of the number of neurotransmitters or the number of receptors they have, or this, this starts becoming a better receptor. So by retrieving information, you are changing your brain. Uh, and that's something they say, we're, we're, we're becoming dumber with our cell phones because it's like, you know, like what was that movie ScarJo was in? And if I, I go and look it up versus let me make myself go through a, a thing and a thing. Oh yeah, she was in that movie with that guy. Every single time you go through one of those neural chains, you're making the memory more durable. And every time I go to my smartphone and Google, hey, Google is that thing, I'm forgetting it more. And so if you actually want to remember something, the, the process of going through the, once on the tip of the tongue, it's kind of like start, wants to fire. And then I go through and it fires. I'm making my brain, my, I'm making a, a stronger connection. When I go to Google, I'm weakening my neural connections. So it's very useful and lovely, but also it can make us dumber. And we know that. How many, how many phone numbers do you remember now? And, Thing, you know, we're, we're outsourcing our information. We're, we're, part of our cortex now lives in these devices, for better or for worse. My, my, you know, I live in Atlanta and driving around. I'm worse now than I was 10 years ago when GPS, you know, back, back when there were maps in my car. Now I have, I, I'm so reliant upon this. And 
we all are. But when, you, when you're forced to remember things, you, you learn it better. And one little example of this is like people who, um, your recall just gets better when you have forced testing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this. Um, and so we talked about that, I'm gonna skip all this. Um, and then part of it, you wanna make learning, there's something called desirable difficulties. It shouldn't be effortless, but struggle is where learning really happens. And there are certain teachers, like getting a perfect copy of teacher's notes, not great, versus here's a concept, we're gonna struggle with it, work on it. That's when things really encode beautifully and longer term when you have to grapple and struggle with information. It's called the gift of frustration. And if you aren't generating errors, if you aren't testing or querying or trying to recall things, you're not really learning very well. So you have to be, that, that's why rereading is very, it's not very helpful. It's errorless. We need to have errors. It's uh, you know, very important. If you're not, if it's too easy, you're typically not learning. Um, and so you want to vary conditions of learning and using testing. It's called um, productive failure. It's actually really important for retention and transfer. Um, so I'm going to go through this. So don't get, you know, you, you, and think about this for a minute. The people with the worst recall, a court stenographer, they're in a courtroom, they're recording everything, transcribing it. You ask them an hour later, what did you remember from this? Nothing. Their recall is zero. They make a perfect copy of everything that happened, but they're not working with it, organizing it, chewing on it, prioritizing it, starring things. They're just putting it verbatim. The brain is not making any choices. And if you aren't chewing, then you're not learning. Um, if you're not integrating, tying, reinforcing, it's just getting transcribing it, you're like, you're, you're so passive. That isn't how learning happens. Um, so all these things, your environment matters. I mentioned that. I like music when I study. I chew gum. I drink tea. Good, clean divisions between work and play, really important. Um, every interruption, as you know, really disrupts deep work and learning. Um, most of us can't multitask. It's not a human thing. Breaks are great. Um, help seeking a major life task and we get better at it. Our lives get easier as we get better at getting help from people. Someone who's doing better than you and, and so forth. And then if kids need help, provide the minimal help possible. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna skip that. Breaks are great. And the final piece, I wanna throw this out. I think it's actually pretty important. I mentioned the idea of executive functioning, the frontal part of the cortex, planning, prioritizing. And there are people who've conceived of this as the hidden curriculum. Like once you, if you're good at this, you become good at like everything academically um, or better at. If you get better at prioritizing, organizing, um, planning, goal setting, follow through, you become better at pretty much every task you undertake. So it's really a big deal. And I think I, I've been very gratified working with the students I've worked with the past couple of years in this area. Um, we actually have a quiz. It's a free quiz, I believe, um, is now in the chat. Um, oh, Hope. Oh, hey, good to see you. Um, one of my friends uh, in the chat. So we're going to put in the chat the um, um, this little link, the quiz. And if you want to, you can go and do a fast quiz about your students' learning and see if, you know, how is my student in terms of all these different skills? Kind of, kind of handy. And if you do that, we'll actually send you a free little video. I've, I've been recording videos. So is John Cadenhead. Um, our head of, of tutoring services about different techniques and tips and things to help kids to get better at this EEF stuff. I think it's really useful. Um, uh, and finally, um, I'm just, we already covered that. And then us, so Apple Road Tutoring, uh, it'll be 20 years in October we've been around, which is pretty cool. We've helped over 40,000 students. Um, started in my, in my living room, kind of neat. Um, but we do all this work now with, with coaching, um, uh, you know, helping kids, academic coaching, and of course, test prep and so forth. And I think there's one final quiz, one little, um, Lauren, if you can throw up the little thing. If there is any way we can help you, just for our own uh, insights, pick something. If there's something useful, we can send you information, talk to you, and so forth. And then if not, you can go ahead and close it out. Um, and, uh, and now I want to hit some questions. Uh, I think there's time, and I'll stay a little bit late. Uh, I always have too many slides. Maybe I'll learn. Maybe I won't. I don't know. It's okay. Um, there's a question a student asked me about how, doing re, how to recall things more with the SAT. I hope by now you asked this half an hour ago, um, doing review, doing practice tests, practice tests, practice tests, really amount. And then stopping and learning everything you've missed. Why did I miss it? Understand it, chew it, integrate it. Don't just do a lot more. You need the time to, to really integrate. Why did I miss this? What's going on? Seeking out strategy, watching videos, Khan Academy, Apple Ruth tutoring. There are many ways but you want to also, over time, spread things out, come back to it. Um, don't do massive, huge, big lifts, but do an hour here, half an hour here. Little bits are really important. Um, 
like schedules for studying. Um, okay, so interesting. Um, can you tell us more about not eating and how it impacts memory? My daughter eats very little food and I wonder if it impacts her ability to learn. Yeah, it's glucose. And there's ample research when they give people like, you know, a little bit of sugar, um, lemonade, uh, you know, like they, they actually can, you know, can focus for longer. And it's, it's I, when I'm taking the SAT, it's a six hour test or five hour test. You know, I, I need snacks. I need breaks because you're using lots of glucose, which is the, the fuel of the body. You're breaking down your stores of energy. Once you haven't put stuff in, in in several hours, like the the glucose stores in the brain get depleted quite naturally, um, and and the, the you know the you need food. So I think it's it's helpful to have snacks if you can get them. Um, and if you aren't eating very much, that'll totally affect your learning, no question. So uh, and you know and good stuff. And be careful of the big sugar spikes, and that you know the high glycemic things which pop you up and there's cortisol, and then you you come back down. And it's hard, and you have. So eating, eating smart, eating well, eating good fats, good proteins, good carbohydrates that are longer to digest. Um, but the brain, you know, the brain drives on glucose, so it's important. How do you bring up more topics while communicating? I don't know what to say when I talk to others because of my, my memory loss from my monitor is blank. Um, so bringing up more topics while communicating. And um, geez, this one, in terms of more topics, I mean, I, I guess I do, my mind kind of pings. I have a, it's not ADHD, but things kind of just bounce. Like I have neurons that are just firing. I kind of follow the firing, but it could be responding to what someone else is saying, um, bringing up other topics. Uh, you know, you're in this dialogue, this dance with other someone else and reflecting back with them, mirroring them, interacting with them, paying attention to them. And you always appear more interesting, the more interest you show in somebody else. And uh, people like you more when you listen to them and attend to them. And so I think, you know, versus teaching. And so I, I think bringing up more things, just kind of paying attention and, and listening to your, your inner voice. But if you wanted to you know, come prepared with certain topics, you could review things or have a list of things. But typically, you know, I like things being more spontaneous, kind of responding to what's happening in the now and meeting somebody where they are and having a nice dance. To me, a discourse is a nice dialogue. It's back and forth. If someone has no motivation to study or is procrastinating, what's the best way to overcome it? So motivation, it's interesting. And there are different reasons for motivation. Some people are putting things off out of um, a perfectionism. They're worried they're not going to do well enough and they're, they're delaying it. Other people, it's a lower level of interest. One thing you can do is trying to gamify things, trying to add a level of competition with oneself, um, trying to add a constraint. Can I make, you know, can I hit a certain threshold? Can I, uh, you know, do it in a certain time period? That might be exciting for somebody, um, having some kind of competitive thing going on. Um, other things you can do is self-consequencing, self-rewarding. I have a student to, if I don't, you know, focus on this thing that I can't have this benefit, I can't go to Snapchat until, and that's motivating. That's kind of using your own reward system to self-consequence. Um, that can be helpful or really limiting. I'll give myself one song, but not 10 songs. One of my students used to really just spend an hour just playing music and learning how to, you know, use rewards. Um, other, mo yeah. So it's, you have to find a way to motivate yourself. Um, thinking about how the work you're doing may actually benefit yourself long-term or may be helpful to others. There's evidence, that I think it's David Yeager, like if you, um, if people who feel like, you know, their work has benefit to society and can help others, that can be motivating to other people. Um, but yeah, it can be finding a way to motivate yourself. And for sure, some classes are tougher, less exciting, more dry. And it's trying to find a way of what's gonna get you excited. Or you're even thinking momentarily about how this might affect you down the road a little bit. Um, once kids are you know, gonna be applying to college, um, thinking about how you know, my grades may be beneficial or impactful, and it's my options, my choices. And this might impact my happiness later, not right now. Um, but just trying to make it relevant to yourself um, versus just like some abstract grade, like what's a 68 or 73 or versus no, this might get me this experience and I can go to North Carolina and have this cool experience and social, so that, that really excites me. This is a means to an end and that's fine too. Because you know, it, it, you're not gonna always be able to be motivated intrinsically by every topic you're exposed to. Some things are just more flat. Some things aren't as exciting, but I, then I have to use my system of motivation using carrots and sticks and rewards internally um, to get myself excited about it or finding meaning in saying this is gonna help me or somebody else. Therefore, I'm gonna stick with it. Um, do you find that listening to music can have a role in setting? Absolutely. I love music and I have certain podcasts. Uh, before I was, play, I was playing my Pandora, I have this studying station. I've, I've played it thousands of hours, um, you know, over, over the years. And also I have a playlist on my iTunes 
Um, I have this Enya, I, I downloaded, like, I, I uploaded my CDs. I still have physical CDs from the 90s. And I played these, the sequence of, of Enya albums hundreds and hundreds of times. I've been doing it since college. And so when I wanna focus or work, I play this certain sequence of songs, my brain knows what to do. Like, oh, now we're working. And I also, I can possibly chew gum. So I was, I was just chewing gum. I'm writing an article for tomorrow. So I play my Enya and I chew my gum and I drink plenty of water. And, uh, and I know I'm in a work zone. So to me, music is part and parcel of how I focus. Um, and, but I, I couldn't listen to like Bob Dylan. I couldn't listen to other, you know, I could play Daft Punk. I can play some techno, I can play Enya, but I can't get too thrown off by, I couldn't play Rumors by Fleetwood Mac, things I want to sing along to. To me, it has to be music that's just, you know, it's going to be no, no text to pull in my, my attention. But yeah, music to me is, is essential. And I probably, I, I do much better with music and chewing gum. That's kind of my thing. All right. All right, y'all. It's 906. I want to say good night to you all. I hope you learned something. Go, um, feel free to go through it. You'll get a copy of the deck. Um, feel free to share this, um, you know, the recording with people. And um, it's, it's fun to learn. So I hope everyone learned something tonight. And thanks always. If you need help with any of this stuff, you know, we're out here. We help a lot of kids. And uh, everyone have a great night. All right, take care.